And good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome to our next CTO Roundtable session. This is um, the first um, Roundtable in 2021, and I hope you, uh, you all will enjoy. I'm sure I will, as um, it's a very interesting topic and, and panel. We're going to discuss the impact of going cloud native. So everyone would say that um, we're in the cloud, uh, but how many of you are actually using cloud native services and what does that mean for people, process, technology stack, etc.? cetera? So um, good to see so many of you. And um, um, we have an international panel today. First, uh, we have Roderick, uh, Roderick Simons, uh, we would say in Dutch. Um, Roderick is based in the Netherlands and the CTO of Jolt. And uh, Jolt is a venture of ING Bank. Uh, hi, Roderick. Correct, yeah. Then um, very proud to welcome my super AWS expert, Jan Chewy. Uh, Jan is a uh, surf AWS surfless hero and the host of the very popular real world surfless podcast. Um, principal consult of the Burning Monk in the Netherlands. So uh, welcome, Jan. Hey guys, good to be here. And uh, last but not least, of course, um, um, CTO of the Software House, Marek Gaida, and Marek is based in Poland. Hey, hey. And nice to be here. I am Gerbert Oudeveldhuis, CTO of Travelia, General Manager of the Software House Netherlands, and your host today. And I will uh, stop here so that we can actually see the people that uh, a little bit better. So. Um, uh, Roderick, um, can I start with you? Can you give a short introduction about yourself and your company, your role, etc.? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, yeah, my name is Roderick Simons, and I'm uh, the CTO of Yolt. Uh, actually, I was uh, one of the founding members of Yolt uh, five uh, five years ago when we uh, when we started. Um, and Yolt actually started uh, as a venture of ING, like uh, like you mentioned, Herbert and. Um, uh, we uh, got an assignment to build a proposition on the promise of open banking. Uh, and back then it was really a promise, right? Uh, open banking or PSD2, as the legislation is called, were not really uh, uh, clear yet. Um, so for the ones that do not know what open banking is, it's a legislation, uh, PSD2, which actually um, allows third parties like Yield with consent of, uh, of, the, uh, of the consumer to uh, uh, get access to account under uh, under open banking, so this means that uh, uh, you can uh, get transaction data or you can initiate the payment. Uh, if we fast forward five years, there's currently uh, two uh, businesses. Uh, uh, I have to say here, uh, YTS and Yolt. Mm -hmm. um, so the Yolt app is a, a smart money app which helps users to manage and save their money, and Yolt Technology Services uh, is actually the company that uh, solves the problem of a lot of different banking APIs in, in Europe in the PSD2. Uh, unfortunately, there's not one standard. Uh, so YTS solves this problem by providing one API that businesses can use to, uh, to connect. And we deliver some value added services on top. Okay. And you have a, a team in Netherlands, Poland, I understand. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so the main development location is in Amsterdam uh, or actually in home uh, because we have people now also in Colombia, in uh, Spain and in, uh, in Tallinn, but mainly it's in Amsterdam and uh, we have uh, development up in, uh, in Poland and Katowice. Okay, very good. So Jan, can you explain in a um, few senses your journey to become an AWS serverless hero and what you do now? Yeah, so I've been uh, doing stuff with uh, uh, on AWS for over ten years now, and uh, I've been you know, always been you know quite active in terms of sharing and talking about stuff I'm learning, I'm doing, uh, and I guess the um, the AWS uh, Heroes program kind of rewards uh, contribution to the community. I guess that's uh, uh, it doesn't it doesn't recognize uh, expertise. Uh, I think I'm pretty good at what I do, uh, but that's not what the Heroes program uh, is about. It's uh, it's because it's uh, it's about uh, uh, recognizing those uh, who uh, actively contribute towards the community okay. in terms of the, all the articles and talks that I've been doing um, and, uh, and the sharing stuff I'm learning. Uh, nowadays, I uh, work uh, as an independent consultant. I help other companies uh, adopt uh, service technologies and, uh, and yeah, and you know, try to do things uh, faster for less. 
Okay, very good. And, and is, is uh, uh, um, the HERO program something you apply for? Is, something, is it uh, something that AWS says, hey, now you're a HERO? Uh, so they've got like an internal committee that uh, every quarter, I think uh, internally they submit, uh, nom that, well, they, they nominate uh, people from the community who they, okay. uh, who they want to reward. Uh, and uh, they've got different categories for containers, for machine learning, for developer yeah. tooling, service, and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you know, amongst the nominees that uh, they will decide uh, uh, who gets picked uh, for this round of the, uh, of the HEROES uh, program. And they've been running for a couple of years now, and I think uh, the the heroes program is uh, uh, is quite big. I, I, I actually don't know how many people are in, in, the, in the program, but it's getting bigger. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Mark, the same question to you. A few sentences on the software house and your role, please. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, well, we are the software house. So basically, we are a software house, uh, as the name suggests. Uh, so we provide the. Uh, custom agile development teams uh, specialized in uh, web development and uh, especially recently in uh, in cloud solutions that's, that's why i'm here and uh, i help clients uh, find um, their best uh, technical solutions for their their business needs uh, so i have uh, this kind i'm representing a a couple of, of of our clients that have a different perspective on the whole cloud topic uh, and I, I hopefully be able to to present that uh, that approaches today. Yeah. And uh, um, and uh, speaking about Jan, uh, we have also purchased Jan uh, a couple of your training uh, packages. Mm -hmm. uh, so good job. Uh, we, developers <laughs> really enjoy it. Thank uh, you. <laughs> okay. Very good. So um, for the viewers of, uh, of today, uh, so please note that the roundtable, uh, you should try to get as most as possible out of the session. Um, and we really would get uh, you know, many questions. We would like that. So just type your questions in the question tab. Um, if you do that, there's a you know, standard Zoom sends it only to the panel. But if you want to do it open, pick every, um, everyone. Uh, but do it in the question tab, and, and we will uh, we will address it. I will ask uh, the panelists uh, the questions that you put in the uh, question tab, and if I can't address them, then uh, we'll try to get back later to you. Okay, so cloud native is um, not just a lift and shift of an application from premises to cloud, of course. So cloud native leverages. Agile, uh, DevOps principles, microservices, container-based architecture. And as always, I, I say it's always about people, process, technology. You know, that's um, Cloud Native also about. So let me share my screen again, then uh, share. So, if you look at the journey to cloud native, it started years ago and um, something we call legacy, where everyone had their own hardware and um, the service level agreement was merely based on hardware running. Um, then uh, virtualization came uh, popular. This removed the reliance on expensive hardware, etc. And the first steps in automated deploy were made. And after that, people started to move to the cloud in the lift and shift model, uh, fully automated builds, um, managing infrastructure as code with tools like Terraform, et cetera, those are implemented. And in a cloud native model, we see uh, fully API driven, stateless, self-healing um, setup and um, auto scaling, et cetera. Um, in that sense, you can do hundreds of deploys of uh, a day without issues. So um, if, you, if you look at this, um, these, these steps, uh, Jan, and um, you see this model, you speak to a lot of companies. Um, and uh, where do you think that the majority of companies are currently? Um, I guess uh, uh, difficult to say because uh, uh, I only know the, the people that are talking to me uh, yeah. and uh, given my sort of niche, uh, the people that are talking to me, I have uh, uh, typically are people who are interested in the serverless technologies and they're looking for help. Um, so I do. So what, what I would say is that I, am, I have seen uh, a sh an increase in terms of uh, people that are getting in touch with me, asking me questions on social media, on my blog, uh, or just getting in touch with me regarding consulting help. 
um, that uh, more and more companies are doing stuff with serverless and uh, uh, not just uh, small companies, startups, but also large enterprises, the companies yeah. that uh, you know everyone would probably know, you know companies like uh, Lego, companies like iRobot, uh, they've all been very deep in the serverless world and are certainly seeing more and more adoption. I think a couple of years ago, maybe you'll find the one or two teams in a very large company doing stuff with a serverless, like a Capital One, there was like one team at a time. And uh, that's where sort of those uh, small flyers that start to sort of grow into a much bigger adoption once uh, you have those uh, success stories. So once you've uh, had a team that found the path to adoption, uh, and uh, you know, now, I guess two years later, now we're seeing more and more wider spread um, adoption and you're seeing companies really large companies going okay uh, as a from a strategy from top level down is uh, saying that uh, uh, serverless first is our strategy uh, we're going to try to build everything using serverless components until we can't because of some uh, either technical uh, limitations or some other compliant requirements or something else uh, that stops us from being able to run whatever it is we want to build on serverless um, so yeah, we, we are definitely seeing a, a much a much broader adoption, uh, and uh, I guess the, that's what I see. Uh, but I also know that uh, the containers market is also huge, uh, just by looking at uh, you know the number of people that are going to Kubernetes uh, uh, conferences and things like that. Um, and uh, you know there are a lot of companies that are still running containers. Uh, but I guess my, my hope is that going forward, the more and more of them we realize that that's not where uh, where they should be at. You know, if you're a company building selling socks, you, you shouldn't be building your own compute platform. Uh, um, so yeah. Okay, no, in, indeed. So, uh, and, and Mark, if, if you talk to your clients, do you see similar movements? Uh, yeah, obviously it's 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 uh, quite uh, similar to to Jan because if we position ourselves as a cloud experts, uh, there are more uh, more uh, people coming to us uh, asking for cloud, right? That uh, we have a uh, we have a couple of very experienced uh, clients that uh, that are cloud native right now, and they really want to um, boost some things in the value, let's say people people that that know how it works, uh, but we also have like lots of uh, uh, opportunities, uh, uh, people asking uh, to on on this first level, uh, as you called it, legacy, and uh, on this lift and shift model, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that they uh, they say that they say that they want to move to the cloud because they know this is uh, this is something great, but they usually require a lot of education. Uh, meaning that uh, usually what they think about the cloud is just uh, like a very, very powerful server with like infinite RAM, infinite yes. CPU and, and, and infinite resources. And this is not what the, what the cloud uh, is, is about, right? And then and especially cloud native, it's not about that, right? And uh, so, so we, we also uh, have to provide lots of education, lots of materials about how cloud actually uh, works. Uh, uh, and then, and usually clients are very surprised how much effort they would need to to get to the to the top of, of this of this staircase that you shown. Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, Roderick, uh, where would you put Jolt uh, in this journey? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think we had it quite a journey of our own. Uh, so uh, being a, a venture of. Uh, ING, we started in uh, on-premise in data centers. <clears throat> um, so that's more in the second, I think, uh, stair yeah. that you showed. Uh, but the, the choice we made back then when we started from scratch is that we would like to have an architecture that, that wouldn't hold us back if we would like to move to a cloud in a later stage. Uh, and and, and uh, we are currently uh, running fully in AWS. But uh, before that, uh, we decided to uh, use a container-based architecture um, microservices based and to use Kubernetes for the orchestration. And I think this helped us quite uh, yeah, enormously in moving everything to the cloud uh, because we had everything already containerized. Um, and then if you look in the past, uh, let's say two years, it's more our cloud journey that started where we uh, first prepared uh, um, uh, the teams and we do everything uh, in infrastructure as code. Um, and I would have say that, yeah, we've come a long way. Are we fully self-healing and uh, uh, out of scaling? That, that's not the case, but I think uh, we've come, come quite far. Okay. okay. And 
so you you see it as as a uh, a step by approach, but I, I guess, and that's also a, a question I get from from the audience. It's not a a linear. It's not one line. You know, it's I guess it's uh, uh, going from one step to the other is uh, is an is an uh, is a process. It's not an event. So it's, uh, yeah, definitely. This this is a, something which took us uh, uh, two years, right? To uh, to go from. Uh, uh, already having the right, let's say, architecture, but not yeah. necessarily having the cloud there. But uh, uh, yeah, that this takes a lot of time and effort to uh, to come there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, if you look at um, behavior and skills um, around moving from one level to the other, um, um, Roderick, again for you, uh, do you see a fear of losing control? Did you, did you have that experience that people were, oh, I could do everything on the OS and now I can do less and less on the OS and, and other people, I need to trust other people so I have less control. And, uh, yeah. and did, you, did you run into that? And you yeah, run? if you talk about control and eh, coming from uh, um, a, a bank with high security requirements, uh, the fear of losing control is actually uh, actually the opposite, funnily enough, uh, because mm -hmm. if, for example, you capture all your configuration, your networking, your infrastructure, everything is code, it is far more easier to compare, all right? If you have an acceptance and production environment, uh, you can do easy comparisons between the two. You can propagate a create environment from scratch. So the feeling of being in control, uh, uh, yeah, I actually have this more, uh, but that's then in relation to security compliance and and yeah being compliant with the policies that you have as a company yeah yeah and as a bank you have very strict compliance and policies of course yeah. exactly and also as we are regulated and to ourselves so that also means that uh, yeah the, we have strict requirements on this uh, on this level yeah yeah and, and marek do you how do you see that with uh, with your clients uh, did you notice some fear of control or with with your own people maybe yeah well uh, 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 I myself uh, I, I com come from from the years when actually developer uh, because I was developer myself uh, uh, created the, all the things from scratch starting with uh, setting up the hosting setting up some Linux uh, server and then uh, building on top of that all the stuff so I always uh, had this kind of uh, control you were talking about uh, because I knew everything what happens on, on each of the levels, right? And uh, with the cloud, you basically, there are a lot of uh, black boxes or moving parts there that uh, you really don't uh, have a, a complete control, control over that. So that's, uh, I think that this, uh, uh, this changes a little bit uh, how, how you see the software and you have to rely on this cloud. Uh, so this is something you have to learn. And my advice would be to... Uh, to introduce lots of uh, how I call it observability uh, to, to the to the especially to the cloud native solutions uh, that you have a proper logs, proper di the diagrams, uh, proper metrics, proper everything to actually get you this kind of feeling that you have a control over that. Okay. And I also add also add something as well because I think control is an illusion. We also we we don't have as much control as we like to think, yeah, and that we always depend on something else anyway. Even as uh, you are building everything from scratch, as Marek said, uh, you're still depending on the OS. You're still depending on the you know, millions of lines of code that somebody else has written is for you. You yeah. you're building something on the, for uh, for the internet. You're still depending on the, inf the infrastructure that actually runs the internet. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a whole lot of other things that we don't think about as things that we need to control because we've never had any control of them in the first place. But yeah. at the same time, the stuff that we actually build ourselves, you know what? 90% of the things that goes wrong are the stuff that I wrote myself. <laughs> and I, I'm the biggest risk in the whole stack of everything <laughs> that my customers Doesn't matter how good I am. <laughs> And uh, having somebody else that do most of the hard work and someone who are more dedicated to getting the, the tiny bit of configuration or something just right and can scale to whatever needs uh, needs to be, that is much better uh, you know, for my customers. And also when things go wrong, I'm not the one that had to wake up at three o'clock in the morning to make sure that the whole system is self-healing and then that someone is on, on call in, in the moment's instance to actually go and fix the problem. That is great for me too and my team. And yeah. the fact that I can get more, uh, making more uh, more of my stack, somebody else's problem, that is great for my customer because I can get more done with less. There's only so much brain power we have and so much time we have in a day to get stuff done. So 
human resources are you know, your engineers are the most expensive resources you have. Use them to solve the most valuable problems. That's going to give you the, your customers the most uh, uh, the most uh, value uh, to the, uh, not not to have them solve some you know setting up machines that somebody else can do much uh, much better job of anyway. Um, but yeah, like control is uh, is is an, is an illusion. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, indeed, and it's good that you add that. And um, what I always say is, you know, it, with with companies like AWS and Microsoft and Google, etc., there's so more many people that are so much better in it than than we are. <laughs> and uh, you know, so many, so much better. Uh, you know, do you need control? And Jan, if, if, we, if we talk about that, so um, you're providing a lot of training um, and, um, you know, for people moving in this cloud native journey, etc. Is that a steep um, learning curve for, uh, for people, for developers? And do you see blockers and maybe an advice? Um, I definitely see uh, uh, there's a learning curve uh, uh, depending on where you're coming from. So if you're coming from a world where you know you're used to running stuff in the on premises, you've never touched AWS. Uh, the cloud is is new to you. A lot of the concepts uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure as code, in terms of uh, continuous uh, delivery, in terms of uh, uh, observability. If all of these are new to you, then it's, it's not the fact that learning about you know, serverless or Lambda or any particular service that's a problem. It's about how many layers of abstractions now you have to learn and how many years of uh, essentially uh, software engineering evolution you have, you have to catch up on because none of these have happened overnight. It's taken more than a decade uh, for a lot of these uh, practices to be in place. But that is the state of uh, what no, state of art for most people now who are doing stuff in the cloud. But if you're coming from a, a place where none of this has been done, then the, that is a quite a big learning curve for you to go through. And I see that's probably the biggest blocker is that uh, when a company who has been um, you know, used to doing certain things uh, in a, in a, uh, on premises, uh, in the um, you know, building stuff with a, with a big monoliths and uh, they never really had to think about how do you, you know, modernize the technology and suddenly they want to move to uh, the new world and suddenly they realize that, okay, there's a lot of things you have to learn first. A lot of the basics have to, you have to kind of unlearn a lot of what you've been, you know, you've been doing and yeah. then learn new things. And I think that's probably the biggest blocker uh, just in terms of how many, all these years of uh, evolution we've had uh, in the industry, uh, microservices, all the practices that have got introduced uh, to make microservices more feasible and uh, scalable, you know, the practices of observability, uh, doing chaos engineering, and uh, all these different things uh, are new to a lot of people. And that's where I think a lot of the challenges lies with a lot of companies that are looking to go cloud native. Um, in terms of advice, uh, uh, well, definitely ask for help and, uh, you, know, you know, getting external help uh, to get you bootstrapped so you can save yourself uh, many months of uh, wasted, uh, you know, trial and error and then come and then realize you're going down the wrong path altogether. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably, uh, you know, something that's uh, really useful to do it at the start as opposed to find yourself uh, in deep in, the, uh, deep in hot water because you spend like a year trying to go down the wrong path, not realizing, uh, hey, that's the way you should be going. And then you're trying to ask uh, someone to come in and help you. Um, so, uh, and also other than that, uh, also, you know, look at things like uh, ADBS has got uh, certification programs. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't say like the certification itself uh, is that valuable, but studying for the certification exams are actually really good, especially if you've got a team who's new to AWS, to the cloud, um, just pick up those certification courses from, say, a cloud guru. Um, they cover a lot of the basics, the, the basic concepts around uh, you know, infrastructure as code, your cloud formation, IAMs, and how those things work, and different services. You know, at a high level, what they do, what do they do? So, putting your team through those uh, courses is really useful. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. Thank you. So I, I had um, recently an experience where um, I spoke to a, uh, a prospect and um, they were saying, we're, we're in the cloud, we're using our private cloud. And so I asked a little bit and um, their private cloud was actually their cupboard where they had machines and uh, they were fertilized, et cetera. But that's what they called their private cloud. And they were really... Um, skeptical of moving and you saw um, 
the average age at uh, that company was a little bit higher than you would uh, you would see in uh, the software house, as an example. Um, so, Roderick, have you have you have experience with that? That um, with with maybe some older and maybe even developers that used to be, you know, these specialists and recognized, etc. That they're you know holding on and and don't want to uh, want to change. You know, this is how we always done it. Um, yeah, maybe a bit of background in in how we do with Jolt. So uh, we have we follow a DevOps approach, like like many organizations, um, uh, but we also made a choice to have a platform team to manage some of the more cross-cutting dependencies. Uh, so let's say we are exploring uh, Kubernetes configuration management uh, automation with, uh, or tooling with, uh, for example, Customize, um, then uh, um, uh, yeah, we are not uh, letting all the teams themselves find out how to work and how, how we can manage this. So this one team will figure it out and they will roll it out into the organization, but also we remain available for Q&A and for support. And I think this model works quite well in onboarding uh, all engineers from, from different uh, uh, age groups uh, um, onto, the, uh, onto the system. And I'm not sure if it's actually the age, which is a factor, but I've, I'm more feeling it's about intrinsic motivation, right? Do you really want to learn and develop as an engineer? Uh, get new skills and one yeah, I actually have more examples but uh, one example uh, within Yolt is uh, the of an engineer is actually one of the older engineers he is doing Java backend but also supporting on iOS on Android and recently he supported the data engineers in Scala uh, and and that's just because he keeps learning and motivates himself to do so yeah. and I think that's important in the hiring process yeah. uh, to find those persons that have this motivation to learn yeah Good, good yeah, point. I think you just have to look at a lot of companies who no longer exist uh, to uh, to see what happens if we just uh, stick with uh, we've always done it this way. Yeah. Yeah, look at blockbusters; uh, <laughs> well, they don't they don't exist anymore, uh, and they had the chance to uh, to uh, to be the the new guy and to, to buy Netflix back in the day. <laughs> Um, and I, and I think I, I agree with uh, Roderick. Uh, I've also seen uh, some of the many older engineers who are probably the most. Uh, uh, the most eager to learn uh, people I've ever known that they're, they're, they're always uh, looking to improve and, uh, uh, and guess reinvent themselves. And I think that's where a, a developer identity really comes in that it can be a, it can be a huge burden if you identify yourself as, you know, um, as a, as a I don't know, dot .NET developer. Um, so anything that threatens your identity becomes something that you intrinsically resist as opposed to, you know, something that you explore and see, is this gonna make me a better developer as opposed to just, uh, you know, digging your heels in and then you know, hope the future never comes. No, it needs uh, with, um, whilst you were saying, I was thinking, what would have happened, uh, you know, in this current situation with my kids if Netflix wouldn't have changed? <laughs> what would they have done without Netflix? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, so, Marek, uh, do you see um, this with, with your clients where maybe a CTO is more ambitious than the developers or uh, maybe even the other way around? Uh, yeah, so there are a variety of, uh, of situations. Uh, I think that some, uh, some clients are uh, a little bit uh, over, over interested in, 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 in cloud native, meaning that uh, they, they just say, uh, uh, yeah, serverless. Uh, yeah, it, it must be serverless because this is uh, this is uh, what comes in Google uh, on the on the on the first uh, on the first spot when I, when I type in modern uh, software solutions or something like that, <laughs> and they just want to use this bleeding edge technologies, uh, let's say, and this is uh, and I I still think that uh, cloud native. Maybe it's not yet there that it's a golden hammer for every for every situation that uh, that is in our lives, and uh, and the and and the others are, are the the ones that uh, really uh, want to keep it uh, as monolithic as uh, as possible, and 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 that and there are obviously some some people that are in, in between. Uh, as Jan said, usually if you have. A, already some architecture based on even APIs or microservices, you will have not, no problem going into cloud native uh, because it's, uh, it, it will just be moving the uh, uh, infrastructure, let's say, but the, the concept, the idea will remain the same. But if you are still in this uh, monolithic uh, mindset, 
Uh, you, you usually have a lot of trouble uh, even, uh, under, even understanding how, how, it, uh, how it should work. And then, as I said, there's lots of education uh, first. Yeah. And maybe also to add to that, uh, Mareka, you mentioned that bleeding edge technology. And I also, also sometimes have the feeling that these more, let's call them experienced engineers, uh, because of their years in the business, also have a better filter for, yeah, I, wanted, I didn't want to say it, but the bullshit filter, right? So because there's so many tools that you can follow and then trying to understand which is best for the company, but not only best for yourself in, in uh, developing your own skills. That's where these, uh, yeah, this life experience uh, comes in handy. Uh, yeah, but there is also this kind of, uh, we call it DX, right? Developer's experience. Uh, so actually in the, in the modern world, I see that uh, you, you, in order to get the best people, you will have to provide them also the technology that they, they would like to work with. And uh, usually they want to work with, uh, with this bleeding edge technologies like cloud native, right? I was... Not, not that I'm not listening, but I'm trying to read the questions that come in also. And uh, sometimes they're long and then you're trying to, uh, to distill the actual question from it, which is uh, a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, so if, if, if you, and there's a lot of discussion about this going on, um, but if, isn't it um, scary to be so dependent on these large providers, actually three? You know, there are a few more, but uh, AWS, Google, um, Microsoft. Um, and maybe do you have an advice? How do you handle that to reduce that dependency uh, on them? Um, uh, Rorik, may I ask you? Um, yeah, it depends a bit on what size of the organization you are, right? If you are a corporate, then uh, and maybe even a financially regulated corporate, then uh, there's an obligation to have a... Um, uh, yeah, let's say a multi-cloud strategy so that there's not that vendor lock-in. You you have to have a strategy in order to go away from that cloud provider if needed. Uh, for smaller companies, yeah, that risk is not not there yet initially, right? So, uh, and yeah, you can do things be maybe staying lower in the stack, using more EA services, uh, but then you you don't have the advantages of when you go higher in the stack to more managed services. So this is a delicate balance, uh, but. I, I believe, I think I once read on the, on the researchers from, from Garden that I believe 90% of corporates have a multi-cloud strategy. So I think for corporates, this is, is quite evident. And for yeah, scale-ups or fintechs, uh, this is a bit of an other game, unless you're regulated and you need to have a strategy around this. Yeah. I think yeah, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm not sure that. that's 100% true because I just spoken with a few banks uh, uh, and uh, the answer I got was that uh, the regulator asked the question of uh, you know, what's the strategy for exiting from your current cloud provider. The, uh, the, the, the question, the intention of the question is not to say that you need to have a, a uh, you need to have multi-cloud strategy so that you can run your workload on multiple cloud at the same time. The question is more about uh, well, have you thought about it and uh, uh, what's, sort of, what's, what's going to be involved and from the risk point of view, um, the, 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 the risk that the, the, the financial regulator is cares about is that as a whole, the whole industry, say the financial industry in the in Netherlands, is not all depending on AWS, that you've got some healthy diversion of uh, some people running on AWS, some are running on Google, some are running on Microsoft, uh, so that uh, if you ever have a problem with Amazon, you don't just lose the entire financial sector, uh, but not on the individual company level. That you, it's not that they're not asking everybody to have, uh, oh, you have to be able to run on multiple cloud at the same time, which then just removes the, you know, the, the ability for you to use any of the managed services uh, besides just you know, taking cloud as a place to run your virtual machines which is not where the value is at. Most of the value that Amazon, Google, or Amazon or Microsoft provides from the cloud offering is in the managed services. Um, and uh, you do see a lot of big corporates that are using, uh, that are you know, pretty heavily invested uh, into those uh, services. Um, there, will be a, there will be a cost of, uh, sh uh, of moving out uh, if you ever decide to change your mind, but there's equally a cost in terms of, uh, well, what if I want to change my application from writing in the Express app to some other framework or to some other language? That's equally as, a, as much of lock-in. Uh, if you look at it, um, I mean, lock-in is not, it's never really a fully lock-in um, unless you've got a contra contractual uh, obligation that you can't move from one uh, service provider, uh, which I don't think is the case with any of the cloud providers. 
but it's, it's, there's going to be a cost of switching. If you ever change your mind, there is a cost you have to pay to do the work at that point. And I think you have to look at it as everything else, uh, as the risk and the reward. And what's the, and you can't just look at it as something as a risk because uh, there's always going to be the other side of the coin, which is what is the return that you get back from the risk. And uh, as, uh, and as uh, adults, one of the things that we learn to do over time is just, you know, pick things that's got low risk but high return so that uh, yeah. you know when we take a when we go outside uh, we don't you know nowadays it's a higher risk than before because of the pandemic <laughs> uh, but before we can still get hit by cars we can still get uh, hit by i don't know random strangers <laughs> on the street <laughs> but uh, the risk is pretty low and we do need to go outside and buy food and, and stuff right um so i think uh, like when the lock-in is not it's something that uh, is probably get uh, overblown over time um too much and uh, it happens all the time like there used to be a vendor locking arguments about databases and then you've got ORMs yeah. uh, coming out everywhere and then we realized uh, holy crap ORM doesn't really help you it gets in the way of uh, developing every day and then when you need to shift uh, from one database to another you end up doing you end up doing more work anyway um, so why spend all this effort up front to prevent to, to sort of help save the cost later on when we don't know what that cost is going to be to be and whether or not we're even going to you know live to see that cost in the first place rather than just do the cost of sw uh, switching when it becomes a problem and i think yeah i've, I've had too many arguments about this event <laughs> thing. Uh, but the, luckily over the last uh, 12 months i would say more with developers less with uh, cto's i think more and more of the cto's even the large companies have uh, uh, have realized that uh, you know when you're providing value to a customer you want to you know you want to be where the value creation is at as opposed to all the underlying infrastructure that enables creation of the, the, uh, the creation of those value yeah yeah good ad thank you um a question from um from mark here um so we we were used to uh, you know working sprints and milestones and maybe even um and um, that brings incremental value. And now with cloud native, um, it might add more complexity in the beginning, takes time away. Um, and it, uh, you know, it's likely that it will take more time to get to the same point, but then you, are, you, have, uh, you, you get back from that investment, of course. So how, how do you handle that? How do you make sure that um, that investment in, in, you know, moving to native uh, form is not blocking, you know, develop, uh, delivering value to the, uh, to the user. Who uh, wants to? Yeah, I think, I think it's a difficult question, right? So you could look at from the metrics perspective. Uh, so uh, you could look at, okay, how often are we going to production as an organization, for example? Um, and maybe currently we're doing it once every two weeks and it takes a couple of days. Uh, and you want to increase this uh, and you want to spend effort on increasing this and then yeah, this metric you could use as an as an, an argument of hey we are going in the right direction and this is investment is actually where it is because now uh, we actually going to production 20 times a week uh, and we are able to deliver far faster value uh, with less overhead to our to our customers yeah and I think like uh, what you mentioned before as well the, you don't have to do a big bang style you can still do incrementally you can take your entire company and then have one team uh, be the pathfinder and then figure out you know how to do this and then um, that, that that team can become the, your success story and then that, that can build the, the momentum in the company so that you do it still incrementally uh, as opposed to trying to move the entire company in one go i like that approach yeah well i, I would even suggest that uh, if this is really an investment uh, meaning that uh, uh, of course, if you have like uh, not experienced, this will be an investment. But uh, for me, actually, a funny thing because uh, some time ago I, I was talking with one of my teams that uh, did did uh, some cloud uh, projects, and uh, it was a discussion about uh, uh, MVP, some lean development, and uh, and uh, I, I suggested uh, okay, so this is rather an MVP, something simple. Uh, let's go to the market with something quick and see how the market responds, right? So let's let's maybe build uh, something simple, meaning that okay, let's build something, you know, uh, with monolithic, with some with some scaffolding, this kind of stuff. 
And they replied, the team replied to me, yeah, you are right. Let's do something simple at first, like cloud native serverless functions instead of building, you know, the, the, the complete uh, thing. So uh, so actually their mindset is already, is already that it's not an investment, but quite the opposite. This is the simpler way of doing things. Interesting, yeah. So um, I, I will uh, look at the questions later. We got, uh, let's move on and um, uh, we'll, uh, please let them come, but so we'll do it at the end of the, uh, of the session. So um, if you look at the native services, et cetera, they're all paper use, you know, per millisecond or per whatever it is. And Lambda now moves to milliseconds even, and not, not 100 milliseconds anymore. Um, that, that sounds really good, but it, it, it also includes the management of, you know, it's a managed service. So in principle, they should be a little bit more expensive. Um, how do you see that, uh, Jan? Is, is it, um, is, are these managed uh, native services uh, more expensive or for what purpose would they be um, uh, more expensive, less expensive? And also, also, of course, uh, labor cost comes around the corner here. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we we we, uh, we said at the end there about labor cost. That's probably the, uh, the the probably key point because you need to look at the total cost of ownership and not just yeah. what you pay uh, AWS. Uh, because it's really easy to just look at what you pay AWS every month and then uh, think, oh wow, you now for this app that's doing a thousand requests per second, uh, this is more expensive than you would take to just run a bunch of servers and then uh, and then you, you know you pay less. Uh, not realizing that uh, to do that, you end up having to hire two other guys uh, paying them, I don't know, 20,000 a month <laughs> just to look after your cluster. And then uh, your total cost of ownership is actually way, way, way higher when you do yeah. that. Uh, but there is certain level of scale that, uh, that you know, when you get to that point, it becomes cheaper to in-house uh, some of these uh, uh, expertise to, uh, to do things uh, with, uh, uh, with, con uh, with containers potentially. Uh, but also it's not just uh, you know, one size fits all. You can always uh, just have uh, things that are running on the you know, Lambda and other things uh, you know, that are maybe not running at full scale. So I was talking to some of the guys at the, uh, at the Netflix a while back. So they did some calculations. Uh, they, they reckon that uh, to run the entire Netflix on Lambda uh, and API Gateway and so on, uh, it would cost them seven times as much. And uh, if, you know, if you look at the, the Netflix the bill, uh, you know, that's going to be a pretty eye-watering number. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, not everything at Netflix runs at Netflix scale. I mean, for everything that's a user-facing API that everyone hits uh, when they log into the app, um, there's a lot of things that just doesn't get run very often or doesn't run anywhere near to the same sort of level of throughput uh, okay. as uh, some of those uh, APIs. So you can always mix and match in the same way that uh, the whole corporate doesn't have to be agile. I mean, you've got different uh, uh, different methodologies. Some are good for like Six Sigma is great for if you want stability, you want everyone to follow the same conventions uh, or you want agile for something that you're building brand new. You want to do lots of experimentations very quickly and iterations, or maybe you want to do lean for products that are already you know, pretty stable and you want to just keep having you know, a steady flow of, you know, of uh, other new things uh, so different different teams different area of your business uh, probably should use different methodologies and similarly different parts of your applications should probably use in different technologies depending on the specific needs if they need something that's uh, you know cheap easy to change quickly then the lambda is pretty good fit uh, but if you've got something that's really high throughput but simple api um then there may be containers is a better fit in that case. So look, but then that also depends on the, the skills that you have in your, in your company. Uh, if you're a small startup, uh, you, probably, you probably want to stick with uh, serverless for a bit longer just so that you can delay the point at which you need to bring in specialist skill set into your company. Because when you do that, that's a pretty big investment in terms of uh, finding the right people, uh, paying agents uh, finders fees, as well as just paying people's salaries and paying for, for heatings in the, and whatnot in the, in, in the office. Uh, when everyone go back to the offices. Yeah, yeah let's hope so. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, in, in, in another um, side of cloud native, and, and um, if you look at scalability, so pandemic shows there are companies that need to be able to scale extremely fast. You know, we we have one of these city around tables with Picnic that they grew overnight 15x. You know, not 15 percent, but 15x. That that's you know. 
And um, so does cloud native give you more options for scaling there? What's your opinion there, Marek? Uh, how do you see that? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we have a, a couple of, of leads uh, screaming for help, let's say, uh, about the, the, that they were drowned in their success, uh, uh, that, uh, that they had some old solutions and uh, they needed to scale up very, very quickly and it occurred that the software is working too slow. And they thought that uh, it wasn't a matter of money, so it was like a shut up and take, your, my, take my money, just m take me to the cloud and make it work as fast as possible. And actually, surprise, surprise, it didn't work uh, because this is usually not the matter of uh, having uh, bigger and uh, and faster uh, computers in the cloud and and suddenly your software will work. It's uh, it's more about creating it in a special modular way, uh, and uh, this this kind of cloud uh, cloud ready solutions that uh, are designed in a way that they can scale right. And uh, I think that uh, going cloud native uh, means that, uh, we, so uh, a couple of years ago, we have introduced the TDD, this test-driven design uh, method. And uh, what was actually the, the product of this introduction was not only uh, obviously the, the fact that we have everything tested, but also the way that developers create their software in order to test it, you have to create it in the special way that there is an input and an output. Uh, so, so this is like an alternative product of introducing testing is that you actually have a, a special architecture. And I think this is the same with cloud native solutions that actually it, it enforces developers from the very beginning to think when they create the software in a way that it should scale. And this is a big value. Anything to add here, uh, Roderick? Um, uh, no, no, yeah, not not necessarily. I think so. Uh, okay. I think in it, it's um, so. I can give an example where um, it's you need to look at it holistically, right? So if you only say, indeed, as as Marek pointed out, only going to the cloud or only adopting a few of these uh, these topics, so we we. Uh, in the beginning where we had quite some growth, uh, we had some data science models running in Python. Uh, and um, so, yeah, you can do kubectl skill uh, the replicas to uh, to whatever, but at some moment in time, that, that is also not very beneficial. Uh, but we also noticed back then that our architecture yeah, was not set up in the right way. So we had to scale the two services at the same time. Well, actually one was causing a problem in the load, right? And, and I think being able to have the architecture loosely coupled uh, allows you to uh, um, uh, scale uh, the services, for example, if you're in a container-based landscape uh, more easily. So yeah, you have to look at it holistically, not only from yeah one uh, um, uh, point of view. Yeah. So I was talking to uh, Mahan, uh, which is the uh, one of the biggest uh, online grocers in the in the Sweden, I think, uh, and they 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 went through the process of going uh, for uh, serverless, uh, moving from a monolithic dominant application a while back. And just in time, because uh, uh, when the pandemic started, uh, their website went crazy. Uh, like, like everyone was just constantly booking. I know it's uh, like there's a, uh, I think they opened up the slots for delivery at midnight or something like that. Within six yeah. minutes, uh, you know, thousands of slots will be all gone. <laughs> uh, everyone just constantly logging in and go, oh, come on, come on, come on. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, the, the, and the serverless was, uh, was uh, they kind of credited the, the move to serverless uh, with the fact that uh, they were able to handle like, you know, tens of uh, 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 several order, I think maybe 10x uh, traffic, maybe even more uh, increase wow. when the pandemic started uh, because, um, you know, they don't have to worry about scaling. Uh, you know, AWS kind of handles that for you. Yeah. And if there's one thing that AWS is really good for at, uh, is just, you know, it's just to scale the applications. Oh, indeed. So, uh, yeah, similar similar experience at Picnic Hat. Uh, interesting. So, um, if you if you look at hiring developers, um, you know the, the the war on talent is extreme, of course. So uh, getting the right people is difficult, and and you see that um, companies are if you're not a Google or whatever um, a big company, they're trying to build their employer branding so that people would like to work there. How do you see that? Is is cloud native being cloud native or not being cloud native helping with that employer branding, uh, Roderick? How do we see that? Uh, definitely. Uh, so to give an example, when we were running on-premise, we had one of our uh, better engineers 
uh, and after uh, uh, two years, he also said, uh, "Yeah, uh, I'm working now with Kubernetes, but I don't, I don't feel that I'm developing myself because I cannot make use of, yeah, features from the cloud, right? Um, so they want to develop themselves, also, also to remain relevant after uh, they move to another company. And um, yeah, with more going cloud native, uh, yeah, you know that for the time being, you are uh, relevant, right? Uh, there's a lot of adoption, growth, uh, so." Um, yeah, this definitely uh, this definitely helps. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Um, looking at the clock, so uh, trying to be on time this uh, this time. So, um, if you um, if you imagine utopia, you know everything is possible, no limits. So, you're setting up a new startup and have a clean sheet in front of you. Um, what would you do? Yeah, I think I know your answer, but uh, <laughs> start with machines in the cloud or go in the cloud native from the start. How do you, how do you see that? Uh, of course, uh, go cloud native uh, from <laughs> the start. Uh, I will probably like my favorite stack nowadays is uh, uh, AppSync, Lambda, DimeDB, and uh, start from there because you can just get so much done. Uh, so quickly, I recently helped a client build a new social network in just a couple of weeks uh, while working part time just on my own. Uh, the, the, the tooling is there that makes your life uh, so much easier uh, to, to build something very, very quickly. And I think that the serverless mindset uh, is, uh, is really good fit, especially for startups, uh, whereby you start with serverless first and then until you can't, uh, maybe one part of the application needs to really scale really highly. And then uh, maybe the, the, the sort of the pricing model just starts to work against you, even with the total cost ownership considered. Um, yeah. Then at that point, maybe you bring in the, uh, um, you know, you start bringing in some uh, more containers, more machines uh, uh, to look after a specific part of your application. Uh, but yeah. That's, my That's interesting. You go from cloud native to machines, and I would have expected that uh, the the transition was the other way around. How do you see that, uh, Marek? Uh, yes, this is exactly what I said uh, first in the, in this MVP. Uh, what I was discussing with the team, yes, right? yeah. they said exactly the same, right? <laughs> that, okay, so let's start with something simple, like you know, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, serverless, and uh, I don't know, Cognito, for example, in Aurora as a database, uh, this managed services, right? Uh, so, so not to worry about it, and then. Uh, when uh, when it gets actually more complicated, we can move to the to the machines. So that, I think that, that there is still maybe this, this kind of uh, of thinking is 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 better. But uh, yeah, I, I agree also with, with Jan about uh, what what he said about these managed services, and uh, this is actually the true the true power of. Uh, of, of cloud native is not only about the serverless, but also about having uh, a good usage of all the other things around that really click and really uh, connect nicely to each other. And, uh, and that's why you also need this kind of AWS certification to get to know all of the solutions that are available there. And trust me, there are lots of them. Yeah. So it's, if, if I look at um, how in, in what, speed things are changing it's um and i'm thinking about the future it's it's a question for all three of you so how do you see cloud native environment changing the coming period it's I, if i look at it it's almost getting close to low code or you know already um so how do you see that going in the next period roderick may i ask you first yeah definitely so uh, uh yeah i think the development goes so fast and the amount of open source tools you can use for a certain problem is exponentially expanding, I have the feeling. Uh, so uh, uh, there is there is um, uh, a lot there. For, so for us uh, and for Yolt, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, we have a strong belief in, in providing a platform, self-service platform for engineers so that they can do their work as fast as possible, possible using the right tools for the right job, right? And we let them choose from a select uh, toolbox, but we are adding tools along the way in this toolbox so that they can use it. And for us, it's to see, okay, what tools should we add? Uh, 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 and we do this in balance, otherwise we explode the organization. Uh, but but adding tools to the toolbox uh, uh, to help uh, yeah, become more relevant, fast speed of delivery um, with more value. And Jan, maybe you have some insights in what's, what's happening. Uh, I don't know, but uh, how do you see future with Cloud Native? Um, I definitely see uh, more people adopting a uh, serverless uh, going more mainstream, which is right now, uh, uh, I, th I think it's, and also seeing like a merge of uh, you know, 
containers uh, with more sort of serverless-like features. Uh, if you look at things like a Google Cloud Run, where you got event triggers for uh, running container tasks, uh, which is something that we still miss in the Fargate. Uh, we don't have that yet. And also see you know more sort of container-like features going to uh, you know, Lambda and other so other more you know what you, I guess what you consider as a serverless uh, uh, offerings. So I probably see more of a blend in terms of the capabilities in the in the two you know, worlds where you know running your infrastructure uh, versus uh, just using a managed service. Uh, you're going to get a bit more options. Hopefully, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And Marek, anything to add from your side? I think that uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's going to be more of uh, an industry standard, meaning also that uh, those biggest providers will have to somehow get along with each other. And <laughs> as Roderick said, uh, currently the biggest corporations, they, uh, they try to be this multi-cloud and this is obviously a big cost for them. Uh, so they will probably push those other big uh, corporations to actually set up any kind of uh, agreement about how this should work and uh, and create this kind of standard that uh, will be implemented by all of them and uh, and then the life for the developers will be much easier because there will be already some framework this kind of cloud native framework this is how i see the future I don't One see day. that happening at all. Uh, I actually think more people realize that multi-cloud is stupid and that they should have done it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so um, let me um, share my screen again. So thank you and um, uh, about that. Um, looking at the time. So the um, before we go to the questions, um, one minute about C2 Roundtable session. We're organizing them every month. And um, we rotate the panel and uh, based on the topic, etc. So if you have a topic that you would like us to discuss and, uh, and work on, just send me an email or type it in the chat uh, um, box here and we will, uh, we will have a look at it. So enough commercials, I would say. Um, I, I saw a nice question and I'm going to do this from the top of my head, but um, how much does upper management and upper management knowledge influence the decisions that, um, that are taken so, and, and the success of those decisions? So, uh, Roderick, do you have uh, an opinion about that? Yeah, so uh, the risk that I have in uh, aligning with my, um, my management, uh, the management team of YOLT is uh, that I go into technical details, but that doesn't work, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you have to relate to them in terms of, uh, of faster speed of delivery, more stability, uh, or what kind of tools can we use to innovate with, right? Um, hey, if we would go for such a managed service or serverless, or we would be able to do this faster, or we would be able to... Uh, provide this new functionality to our end users and, and, and clients. Um, yeah, so uh, so uh, that's that's I think the lesson that I learned in in the past years uh, um, uh, uh, talking with uh, with our management team. Yeah. Okay. And a question for you, Jan. I, I guess I don't know if you already answered it on the chat, but I I, um, I saw it coming in. Um, you know, debugging of serverless apps. There's a lot of discussion about it already, always, and it's difficult, etc. Any uh, word of advice around uh, tooling for that? Uh, yeah, I answered that. Uh, I answered that in the chat already. Um, so I think uh, if you look for. Uh, so you, like observability is a big part of a uh, server applications because for one thing, you're going to be building more event-driven systems uh, which are more interesting and also more difficult to, uh, to monitor and, and support. And I think uh, if you look for uh, tools that are more sort of designed and, and you know, focused on serverless, things like uh, Lumigo, Absagon, and Thunder, uh, you have a much better time uh, dealing with, with the application and running in production compared to using uh, some of the like, native solutions from AWS, which uh, mm -hmm. I think is uh, easy to get started and all that, but uh, they don't do, they're not as capable as some of the more specialized tools. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, Sorry, can't uh, handle more questions, but I will get back to those I uh, didn't answer. Um, so thank you, Roderick, for, uh, for being here. Jan, again, thanks for, for being here. And Marek, of course. Um, insights were very valuable, and I believe this was an interesting discussion. I found it very interesting. So uh, 
So I, uh, you know, unfortunately cannot give you a physical gift now. So you should have something in your inbox. Uh, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. So thanks again. And with this, uh, we end the CTO Roundtable session and I uh, hope to all see you next time. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. 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 Bye.